Hi, Paul Rudwick, Clark County. This is WIM training video three. Hopefully it has been helpful so far. So before I get too deep into sizing this pond the right way, I am going to run my pre-developed scenario. Should be pretty quick. Yeah, that's pretty quick. And then I'm gonna run my mitigated scenario. Now, as I mentioned, I think this three inch diameter is way too big, although I have a quite a large pond here. You know, I'm gonna make this five inches. This pond is huge, by the way. I'm gonna make this six, uh, except for five, 100 by 100. This is a key value to look at this pond riser at pond volume at riser head now i would say from my experience for that type c soil i'm probably going to be looking at let's just call it eight inch seven inches so if i have one acre of impervious i probably want this to be like 0.7 roughly This should update. Uh, oh, weird. If I make this go down to four. Okay, I made that way too low. 50, 50, 80, 80. Okay, that's probably good enough. I'm just throwing this in there. There's a way to automatically adjust all these values. You're never gonna remember how to do all this. Um, I often like to apply evaporation to the facility. Okay, and then I'm gonna run this scenario. I'm only doing this to kind of show you what the results and outputs are. So you know kind of what you're your, your goal is before you kind of set up a model that actually will work. Okay, so I ran the pre and the post. Let's see what I came up with. So now I'm ready to click on the analysis tab. And there's a bunch of different buttons up here. I usually push the stream flow duration or the flow frequency graph. And I'm gonna hit the flow, well, I'll hit the flow frequency first because it's a little bit easier to understand. So first you hit this. And then you got to pick which data sets you want to pick. Currently, I'm in all data sets. I could probably pick this one right here if I wanted to. But I'll often hit this little tab down here. These tabs kind of help you sort the data better. So I'm going to hit that, and it just pulls up just POC1. And this gives you a really good picture of what is actually happening. Don't even look at the graph. It's a little bit uh, confusing. But I guess we'll look at the graph after we look at this. So for a two-year event, so for a quite a low flow event, in our pre-developed for it, one acre of type C forest, we have a runoff of 0 .2, 0 0.027 CFS. With our pond, we have a runoff of 0 0.0695. So we have to be all the, well, not all these values, the 50, and all the way to the two year need to be below. Like this needs to be below that. This needs to be below that. This needs to be below that, et cetera. The 100 year can actually be above, but the 50 year needs to be below. And that's kind of gets to the, this concept of thresholds. What are we actually designing for? Let me pull up another. This section might be the one I want right here. Okay, here we go. So we imagine, I don't know if you know much about storm water frequency 
uh, of storms. But essentially these 100 year, 50 year, 25 year, 10 year, two year, these all correlate to different size storm events. So a 100 year event, often they say, oh, the, the, the current, most people think a 100 year storm is a storm that occurs once every 100 years. It's not actually accurate, but it's not a terrible way to think about it. Um, it's actually, it actually means that there's a 1% chance of it occurring in every, in any year. Same with the 50 year. It, it occurs once every 50 years. Actually, it means two per, the 2% 2 chance of it occurring every year. So I guess the 50 year event, it's kind of, it's been a, easier to get your mind around, I guess. But if you think about it, these 50 year or 100 year event, these are very infrequent events. Not gonna happen very often. Whereas the one day storm is a storm you'd expect to happen, I don't know, once a day. So I don't even know what size event you could have for that. But it would be, it would be very small because this is a very frequent storm event. So there's not, there's a very high chance of it happening. So no one ever thinks about stuff in the one day event, but people often think about things in the two year event. So a two year storm event basically means that there is a 50% chance of it occurring every year. So pretty darn frequent. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a quick primer on uh, what that storm event size might even look like. So they have these things called isopolluvial maps, which are kind of like kind of like contour maps, but for stormwater. So this is a two-year event, two-year 24-hour design storm in Clark County. So you can see as you kind of head up in the mountains, it gets higher. But where where we uh, this is kind of the main area where we're doing a lot of development. It's kind of lower storm events. So we're talking about two inches of rainfall in 24 hours is a two-year event. Now, if you go down to the 100 year event, now we're talking about four inches of rainfall in 24 hours. So again, what this means is there's a 1% chance uh, for a 100 year event, there's a 1% chance of some sort of 24 hour event having four inches of rainfall. Whereas there's a 50% chance and 50 percent is just comes from one over two that in every year there's going to be a, a two inch rainfall 20 two inch 24 hour rainfall okay hope that makes some sense so what is the threshold for stormwater mitigation, stormwater flow control in the state of Washington. Now, you have to match or be lower than the forest pre-development condition, which is almost always forested, between a certain range of storms, between the 50-year and 50% 50 of the two-year, which is essentially the one-year event, roughly, which is basically a storm that has about 100% chance of occurring every year. So for every storm event between this range, and if you go back to your our wind model, you actually see there's no 50% of the two years. So there's actually another event lower than this that we have to be below. So between this range, so for the two year, the 10 year, 25, 50, and everything in between, you know, for the eight year, for the 15 year, 35 year, whatever, we have to be, this event, this flow rate has to be lower than this flow rate. Hopefully that makes some sense. And then there's also one lower than. And almost always, I've never, I'm not sure if I can think of an example of when this is not true. So basically I'm gonna say almost always, the lower events, like the two year and the 50% of the two year are the ones that cause the stormwater, um, the stormwater pond to fail. Your stormwater pond's not big enough, 
the orifice size is too small, whatever it is, or too big, um, you don't actually meet that meet that goal that we had um, previously of you know having this and this equal that. Okay, so you kind of get a good sense of what this actually means. Now, this is the stream protection duration again. We're trying to protect our stream. That's our goal here. This is the one that is really the, the crucial tab. This is where we check to see if our pond passed or failed. I can already tell you it's going to fail based on that other one that we looked at. But we basically we want this red line to be all on the left side and below this blue line. You can even see it tells you that you failed um, for a bunch of these storm events. Now it's weird because I pretty much knew I got the right size pond event, right? Now it's telling me, um, actually the really interesting thing about this is that it's telling me that for low flow events, these really low flow events, I'm actually below. Um, the, I'm actually, I have lower flow rate in the mitigated condition than the pre-developed, which means that it's working for these low flow events, but for these higher flow events, it's not working, which is interesting because it doesn't really match up with what this says. Oh. Never mind. I just read these wrong. So it's saying that this event is higher than this, but I there actually is not a um, there's no zero here. So this is way this is way higher than that. So okay, this is correct. This is ten times that value. Okay, so that does make sense. Another interesting thing we could look at is. We could see, so this is this. Remember, if we go back to our chart here, point of compliance one is our point of compliance after it's flowing out of the pond. But what if we wanted to know what it was flowing out of the the off the parking lot, or you know, our half rooftop, half parking lot? What would that tell us? So interestingly enough, we can check that right here. Although it doesn't seem to be working. Anyway, this should be a lot higher than these values. reason it's not pulling it up. Well, now I'm really curious. So I'm going to I'm going to set this one to and I actually have to rerun these scenarios to make this work. There is one thing about WIM that is good to know. Basically, if you ever change anything, make sure you rerun your model. See so up there, it's telling you what year it's running right now. Okay, let's try this again. Now, POC2. Now, this should be way off. Yeah, here we go. So you can see way over to the right. This is with no pond. Let's go to our flow frequency. Where did that go? Could have sworn I just copied it into the spreadsheet. Oh, there it is. 
I guess I, who knows what happened. Okay, so this is really interesting. This is our, remember, this is our mitigated, this is our pavement. And these are the same values you can see right there. 0 0.3, 0 0.06, 0 0.39, 0 0.2. Look at this. <laughs> While this these values are higher, at the 50-year event and the 100-year event, it actually has, we have more water coming out of our pond than we do in, in the pavement condition. So if we have a huge storm event, our pond is actually making things worse than if we just had, yeah, than if we just had a storm water, no storm water facility. That's really interesting. That means that our pond basically is terribly designed. Not only is it not meeting our goal, but yeah, it's actually worse in certain conditions than not having a pond at all. All right. I'm going to disconnect POC. I went back to the pre-developed. So I'm going to go back to POC1. This is POC1. I'm going to run this again. So this time, I know that my low flow orifice is probably the right size. I'm guessing that this riser notch is way too wide. The notch width of two feet, I'm sure it should be like 0 0.2, 0 0.15, or something really low. Um, and I'm going to do something cool called the auto pawn run this first. You don't have to run it here, but sometimes it can help the auto pond a little bit if you kind of get this closer to where you know it should be. Now the auto pond essentially is a super sweet tool that kind of optimizes your pond for you. I would say going back and forth, switching these parameters, switching the size of the length and the bottom, and go into the analysis tab, it would take you ages. So this auto pond is, I would say, crucial to this program working. So I always go all the way to the end because I've found that if you pick these kind of quicker adjusters, sometimes it can give you wildly different results than the this best solution. So pond depth, I usually do five feet here. More than a four foot pond is kind of hazardous, a uh, foot of freeboard. Pond length the width, I'm going to do one to one, so you can have 80 to 80. You kind of know a general sense of the pond. Um, the geometry, you can you know put in two to one here, or 1.5, whatever you want to do. Pond slide slopes, three to one, that's pretty typical. If you want to have a flatter pond, you could have, maybe try to get away with, get away with something without gates. You could do like five to one or six to one. Um, but in reality, we're not that concerned with the length and the width that it's going to output. We're mostly concerned with this volume value. We want to set our elevations correctly, and we want to get the diameter and the notch sizes and lots of everything correctly. Maybe let's click on this just so we can remember what this all this means. So here's our orif bottom orifice size. That's the 0.5 inch. That's saying that water is trickling out of here, and that's the water that's going towards the stream. And as it gets to a certain point, there's a riser at the top, but it starts spilling out that riser. So if it's two feet wide, you know, it's coming out there really quickly. And if it's 0.2 feet wide, which, what is that, like two inches? It's coming out a lot slower. Alternatively, you can design with uh, three orifices. Um, I don't really think there's a huge advantage to either one. They usually give you roughly the same values. Uh, I think oftentimes a taller pond, if you have like a seven or eight feet pond, 
say you have like an eight foot underground storage pond that sometimes you can get a benefit from three orifices. Um, but it doesn't really matter for this type of pond. Uh, but feel free to play around with it. I would be happy to hear your input. So I'm going to create pond here. And this can take a few minutes. Um, but you can kind of watch it as it's working, which I think is really kind of fun. And again, our goal is to have the smallest pond volume at riser head possible. That's the smallest pond, smallest attention pond. I'm guessing this 0.8, probably pretty close to what we'll end up with. But I imagine that these other values are going to just be radically different. Um, Oh, here we go. It's even smaller. Great. So you can see they made this 1.3. They made that notch width way smaller. Um, they made that a little bit bigger than it was before. Now, this low flow diameter orifice is a crucial piece of the design. Um, Let's see, we're at 93 by 62. Oh, I did the pond side slopes at one to one, which is not really advisable. So I'm going to actually change that to three to one. Oh, that's pretty quick. The nice thing is once you've already made a pond, it kind of uses the recent input. So it goes a little bit faster. This is actually a really fast pond. Uh, I'd recommend if you know roughly what those parameters are, it's good to put them in first. If you start by just hitting quick pond and then hitting run, you know, the numbers are, it takes a little bit, takes a little bit while, a while to get it done. You're kind of helping the computer program along, along a little bit. I'm not sure if you've seen that movie. Um, now I'm blanking on the name. Was it Alan Watts? That name? No, that's not right. World War II code breaking. Movie. Imitation game. In the imitation game, they have this cool computer program that can determine the Germans' German coding of, you know, they have some sort of secret code that they change every day to determine what they're broadcasting. And they figure out kind of, as they're, they're stuck, the computer can't quite figure it out fast enough. So they figure out a few keywords that they can tell the computer that are correct and kind of help the computer along a little bit. If we give you, instead of having 26 variables to figure out, we're going to give you these five. And the computer can figure it out. Here we go. 0.61 acre feet. So that's the pond we ended up with. And so let's check our analysis and make sure, but I'm pretty much guaranteed it'll work. So now when we check here, again, those same values. Point oh seven two four eight seven blah, blah, blah. But now all these values are below that. So below that. So it works. Stream protection duration, again, this is the one that's key because this is the one that says pass or fail. And see, red lines are all below, passes everywhere, bada bing, bada boom. You can see that 99%, I don't know if you have any interest in knowing what this is, but this is kind of interesting. 
statistic, or this is kind of interesting to think about what these numbers mean. Um, essentially, how this works is they pick certain flow rates. I think this one actually might be 2% of, let me look at this again. They do line up. So you can see like the two-year event, I think it starts with the pre-developed. So point two, so this is the two-year event right here in the pre-development condition. So it starts with like values like that. And then I think I'm guessing this 0.0136 is half of the two-year, is that right? Yeah, there you go. So we take that two-year event, and how does it figure out the two-year event? Well, I could get into that for you, but basically there's a hydrologic analysis that it does looking at the annual peaks and probability analysis using, usually you use log Pearson type three. You can basically generate probabilities of certain events happening every year based on your peaks. So they create these and then you have your 50% of your two year, which is the lowest value you have to you have to pass for. Again, remember. Fifty percent of the two year to the fifty year is the requirement. So they look at this value and they say okay, we have all this rain gauge data. How many times is it above this value? So our pre-development flow rates above 0.0136. And I mean, I don't know how long this data, how long the data is for this, but I'm making it up, but it's a hundred years of data. Because 5,022 divided by 100 is 50. Um, 50. You see, to uh, figure it occur, you, you figure it occurs every year. Maybe it's 50 years of data. I don't. I don't exactly know. More of the story is, this is the amount of times it passes it through the whole rain gauge record, and maybe it's 80 years, 100 years, or whatever. So 5,000 times it's. The flow rate coming off one acre of forest is bigger than that. And in the mitigated condition with our pond and our driveway, how often is it bigger than that? And the answer has to be lower than that value. It's essentially how it does it. So checking our two-year, 0.0272, roughly here. It's saying 600 times, and this is actually something we can probably figure out how long the data is. If it's 600 times the two year times 0.5%, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, some of these numbers, I guess, aren't perfect. Who knows? What they're saying, 600 times it exceeds the two year. In our mitigated condition, only 555 times. So we have an 84% improvement over the existing value. Keep going down. Let's try the 10 year 0.0615. They're saying three times in the pre development and zero times in the mitigated. 
So they're saying the flow rates never get that big in the mitigated. And then C goes all the way up to the 50 year. So remember in our example of where I made that terrible palm that didn't work, that it was, it flowed off higher. In this example, they're basically saying through the whole rain gauge record, you're never going to get a, you're never going to get a, any runoff bigger than almost the five year. So according to this model, at least this, this pond works great. Um, so that's a really simple stormwater pond example. See if there's anything else you can learn from here. This is, can be a helpful tool to, again, look at the outfall structure. Citro rear is supposedly the most efficient type of weir if you really want to get fancy. So how would you even put in a Citro rear? I don't even think there's an option in here for that. So if I want to do the three orifice, I could make that flat and then add in these orifice numbers. Um, I guess I can do a sutro rear in here. The thing is, I don't think you can, you can't do an auto pond with the sutro rear. So that would, you'd have to do some serious math to make it work. It'd be a lot more work, but uh, theoretically your pond could get a little bit smaller with the sutro rear. This table is quite helpful. Essentially what this table does, and I guess you can't make the window bigger, is it gives you stage storage and surface area and discharge at different elevations in the pond. So basically, remember our pond is five feet tall. So it goes all the way up to five feet. We know what the bottom length and width are. Bottom length is I guess they give you in acres. It's 68.5, roughly. 68.5 times 68.5. So that's the bottom surface area. Divide that by 43,560. And that gives you our bottom area. Now, as you go up, the pond has these sides, a you know, three to one slope. So it's getting more and more surface area as you go up higher and higher and higher. And so that kind of reflects it in the storage value. So this is how much storage you want, we're getting. And then this is the flow rate out of the pond at those elevations. And remember, we have an orifice at 0.552. So at the very bottom, we have this orifice at 0.552. Now, how do they calculate that thing? Well, that is a simple orifice equation. Well, that's not really simple. This is essentially the orifice equation right here. So, I mean, does it, is it actually right? We know we have point five. We have point Q C D A. So this is equals 
0.552 dimer squared over 4 times pi. 0.24 cubic feet. Is that right? That's in inches. I'm sure you divide this by two first. So this is my value, pi r squared divided by 144. So pretty small value in cubic feet. And then our head value, C value, Point six two, I believe, is what it typically is. Equals this times this times square root uh, two times thirty two point two for gravity times h. Okay, let's see what I came up with. at one foot, 0.002869. Look at that. Freaking awesome. It worked. Two feet, 0.011. See, this is exactly the formula they use right here. Basically, they use this formula based on the head or the depth of water over top of this orbit, pushing it out. And then you can see um, and actually, I changed the weird information. I think it was like 1.6 from the top and 0 0.01, something like that, feet. So if you take, the rise is 4, so if you take 4 minus 1.6, maybe it was 2 feet still. I can't actually remember what the answer was. You can see there's a huge there's a huge jump right here at well that's actually that's not even right. There should be a huge jump at like 2.4. 2.5. Let's see if we get type in 2.5. Gives us 1.31. If we get three. Anyways, as I'm changing this value, it actually should be changing the chart. But you can see once it hits that overflow height at four feet, then it starts pouring out of this really, really quickly. Because now we have an 18-inch diameter, and then it starts really pouring out. So if a huge amount of water flows into your pond, it has a way to get out. What else? All right, I think that's enough. Oh, okay, I guess there it is again. Notch height of two feet. 0.01. So at two feet down from four, I'm at two. There's a little bit of extra water coming out, but it's pretty darn small. I mean, 0.01 feet. It's 
0.12. It's barely any more water coming out, just a touch more. But I would expect, I got three feet. At two feet, is exactly lined up. Oops. At two feet, is exactly lined up. Now as I go to 2.28, now this is starting to, you can kind of see that this, because that notch is now affecting the flow rate out of here is starting to go up faster. As I go up to 2.6, it's going to be probably way lower. Now this is 2, 0.029, that's 0.02. So it's still way lower. As I head up to 3, point oh four oh nine. 0.0143. So that notch is really increasing the flow rate. And the, the main reason for that is if you think about how a notch might work, as it goes up higher and higher and higher, now we have this area is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. At three feet, we now have not just, you know, it might only be a Not only be a 0.1 inch wide notch, but if you multiply that by a foot, we now have, you know, one foot times 0.012 inches, which is like, you know, two of these orifices. To get, you're adding two more orifices right here, basically. So water is really starting to pour out of there quickly. All right, I think that's enough for this video. I might do one more and then call it good.